man, uh, we, uh, we've been uh, working through this series uh, on idols. And uh, idols are, you know, one of those things that, uh, you know, we don't, we don't like to think we have idols. But the truth is, is that we, we all have idols. We all struggle uh, with worshiping other things sometimes. And uh, the truth is, is that God created us. We've been talking about this. God created us uh, with uh, the desire to worship something. Uh, of course, that's something that he gave us the desire to worship was to worship him. But the truth is, is that we trade him out sometimes unknowingly. Uh, you know, we just kind of fall into uh, this, you know, whole, uh, you know, thing of, you know, just uh, we just get into something, you know, and, and, and that something is usually a good thing. It's usually not a bad thing. I mean, sometimes it can be a bad thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, we we make good things bad things by turning them uh, into idols in our lives, and um, you know this this whole series has been based around that. In fact, it's been based around a book by Tim Keller called Counterfeit Gods, and uh, I think we even have it out there, or whatever. But uh, um, anyway, just uh, the scriptural basis of of the study is, of itself stands by itself, and 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 that's that's what I've been kind of focused on here. But uh, there's there's a lot that uh, I've gleaned from him, been sharing with you, and can, will continue to share with you. So I want him to make sure that. I want to make sure that he gets credit for that, uh, and we'll probably even read something uh, even out of the book today. Uh, we'll check it out. Uh, but uh, today we're talking about success. Success. Everybody, everybody wants to succeed, right? I mean, no, nobody wants to lose. Everybody wants to win. You know, I love. I've got. I've got some friends I like to go to lunch with every once in a while, and one of the things that we talk about when we're at lunch is they talk about their bets. You know, they're betting on who's going to win this game or that game. I won't name their names because they all go to our church. Uh, but we, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in good fun, and, 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 uh, and I, enjoy, I enjoy being on the sidelines as a part of the conversation, you know, getting to hear these things. But, I mean, we, we love to win. We love to be competitive. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with winning. There's nothing wrong with being competitive. But just like everything else we've been talking about, we can take a good thing and we can make it an idol, and we can worship it, and we can make our life about it to the point that it's a bad thing. And all of a sudden, we've taken something that was great, and we've turned it into something that is not good for us because it is now the driving force in our life. Uh, oftentimes, uh, and, and we see this, especially amongst successful people, uh, we see that, that it, it becomes like a drug, you know, and to the point that it, it begins to, uh, we begin to identify with whether or not we succeed or fail, whether or not we win or we lose, you know, and, and it just, it keeps you wanting more and more. We become addicted to it, uh, you know, and, and here's the funny thing about success. In, in our culture, we are, we are praised for success, you know, oh, wait, great job, you know, and we want to do that. We want to encourage one another, and we want to celebrate people's victories with them. I, you know, I want to be a person who celebrates victories with, with uh, people around me and that kind of thing. I, you know, I think that's important, uh, but we, we let that, you know, we let that sink in on us, uh, and, and we, just, we just end up seeking that. We end up seeking, uh, you know, praise and, and, and looking for it to be our worth. And that's not what we want to do. And so, uh, you know, it, uh, when it begins to take over our identity, you know, we say things like, uh, there's so-and-so, and they do this, and they own that, and they started this thing, and they do that thing. And they're really well known in this area for that, you know. That I mean, and honestly, that's what that's what we want people to say about us, right? I mean, we want people to say that kind of stuff about us, you know. I and mean, I don't care who you are. I don't care. I don't care if if you work in a machine shop or if you're a pastor. You want people to think highly of you in what you do, especially men. Men attach even more so than ladies. Uh, hence why I mentioned this last week, the Ephesians 5 piece of, you know, love and respect and, and that men were created really needing to be respected, you know, that that thing is in us or whatever. You know, we, we man, we desire that. We, we will let that drive the ship until the ship goes down. You know what I'm talking about? 
And we see that, and we see, and that's why you see like when somebody that maybe had a business or something, and the business ends up failing, and, and, and you, you know, you'll be having a conversation one day with somebody and be like, whatever happened to that guy? Whatever, whatever happened to him? You know, and you'd be like, well, you know, business went, you know, he just like disappeared after that happened, right? Why? A lot of times because we put our identity and our self-worth in those things, and when the ship does go down, Folks don't know how to deal. They get depressed. They go and hide. They run away from everybody and everything. And as much as we want to think that people are constantly saying these things about us, the truth is is that most people are not saying these things about us. And, you know, maybe they are thinking some of them or whatever. But, you know, I, I told somebody a long time ago uh, that had a moral failure, uh, a friend of ours, and um, he had a moral failure, and, and he was really struggling with what to do. And, you know, we were months removed from that thing happening, and a lot of people knew what had happened. And he said to me, you know, Chris, I just can't really even go to church anymore because, you know, <coughs> I know I know what everybody, you know, thinks about me, and I know that people are just constantly talking about it. And I said, you really think that? I said, you really think that months after this, like this is all people have got to talk about is this thing that happened in your life like six months ago? You really think that? It's like you don't think that they don't have their own junk to deal with and that they're not struggling in life and trying to figure their way through this too? It's easy for us to get in our head and play those games. When we take away the ability to succeed in something, you know, that's a lot of times when we find out that success was an idol, you know, and, and in fact the passage of Scripture that we're, we're looking at today, uh, you know, shows us that, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But, I mean, for example, you know, if you, you, you take away the ability to work, like somebody loses their job, maybe because something actually happened where they can't actually work. Uh, we saw a lot of this in the recession. Um, you know, or, or, I mean, just any number of things. Just remove something from somebody's life, you know, and, and again, can be great things or whatever. It could be uh, that you were being a good parent and then the child has moved away, you know, whatever it is. I had that conversation yesterday uh, with, some, with some great friends. You know, and, and it's just a, it's a struggle, you know. But it shows us a lot of times that our idols often are in things that are good, but we have made our identity being that instead of being a Christ follower. And I think, I think that's, that's a big statement for us today. And, you know, and along with that statement is this statement, have you ever failed? Question, have you ever failed? You know, of course you have. We've all failed at something at some point, and it stings. It stings. But it shows that we have a struggle in our life a lot of times when those failures come because a lot of times when the failures come, they shed light on what really are idols in our lives. They show us our struggles. They show us our issues um, that we have placed our trust and faith into a thing that's bringing us security. Now, there's a word, security. We love security, you know. And, and, and the truth is, is that success oftentimes is driven by the desire to want security. Everybody wants a little security. But the truth is, is that these things that we think make us secure are not lasting things. They will go away. And they can be taken away in a heartbeat. We've seen that. We've seen that in the lives of people around us. If you've got a Bible, pull it out. We're going to go to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers will bring you one. Show your hand up. If you don't own one, you can keep that one. We'd love for you to take it with you. 2 Kings is where we are today. We, uh... I didn't hear nothing. I don't, I don't know what y'all laughing at. <laughs> Somebody's in here like watching TV shows from the 40s on their phone or something. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> oh, man. 
wasn't too funny. Um, Second Kings, and 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 here here we have a guy who is you know kind of reminds me of David a little bit, to be honest with you. This guy uh, uh, Naaman, and uh, you know he's uh, he's a he's a bit of a uh, a soldier. In fact, he's he's a chief soldier, uh, commander of the army, and that that sort of thing. And uh, I want I want you to read this with me. Let's just go ahead and read this. This is Second Kings chapter five, and in verse one, and it says this. It says Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. So this is like the guy over the army for the king. He's like, here's the king, here he is. Like you know, we're buddies. You know, we go hang out and eat crab legs together. I love a crab leg. Commander of the army of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. We'll stop right there. So we've got this amazing resume on Naaman. And, and it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, he's the man, he's the man, he's the man, he's the man, he's got leprosy. I mean, that's, that's, basically, that's basically the buildup right here, okay? And so we've got a guy who's been super successful, he's done his thing, and then now, you know, he's got this struggle in life because he has contracted this medical condition that literally is going to eat away at his body inch by inch and it will die off. He's, 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 in, a, he's in a mess, Okay. And and so this is how this is how we start out the thing. And and I think, you know, this this is very indicative of a lot of us, you know, as we get into something in life and maybe things are going well and then all of a something something all of a sudden something happens, you know? And it's all of a sudden it's like, oh what what am I supposed to do now? You know, kind of thing. Very, very uh, you know, we can we can definitely identify. Verse two it goes on, it says, Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told the Lord thus, and so spoke thus, and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So we have this, we have this young girl, it's a child, you know, they, some are saying, you know, think, you know, I don't know how they even come up with this, maybe 12, 14 years old or something. Uh, but she uh, was taken, okay, first of all, she was taken during a raid uh, in another country, okay, and so now she's living with this family, she's w- living with Naaman's family, and she is basically a servant girl to Naaman's wife. She sees Naaman get leprosy, immediately she says, well, if only he could get to this prophet that was in Samaria, this dude would heal him. This is an interesting turn of events, and what's to follow is even more interesting. Uh, as it goes on in the rest of verse 5, it says, So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When the letter reaches you, know that I have sent you to Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Basically, the king's like, What? What? You want me to do what? So, backtrack for just a second here with me. Naaman is told by the little girl, or she tells somebody else, and word gets to him or whatever, that if he'd go see this prophet, the prophet would heal him. You know, and this would be because of the Lord using this prophet, and that's the way uh, it's kind of put there. And so, but then furthermore, uh, Naaman goes to his king, and he says, look, 
you know, this is what I found out. What do you think about me going out there? And the king's like, oh, yeah, man, you know, let me, let me write you a letter of recommendation, you know. And so he does. He writes him a letter and he sends him to the king of Israel. The funny thing is, is the little girl never said anything about going to the king. But this shows you a lot of how successful people work. Successful people, and I'm, I don't know that I'm successful, but I'm definitely guilty of this sometimes, of like, you know, like, who do we know that we can pull some strings, you know? Like, I, you know, and, and I enjoy that sort of thing. I, I love helping people when people call me and go, do you know anybody that, you know, whatever, fixes the floor of a pool? Like, you know, and I'm like, ah, you know, I know some people that work on pools, you know, you know, and then, you know, give out num- names and numbers, whatever it is. You know, I enjoy that kind of thing. It's fun. And in, in a Naaman situation, he and the king both make this assumption that the best thing to do is for him to not just go to Israel and look for this prophet, but to go to Israel and go to the king, that the king would order this prophet to do this thing for Naaman. Not what the prophet, not what the, not what the little slave girl said, you know, but that's what they're doing. And, of course, he gets there, gives him the letter, and that king's like, Dude, you've lost your mind. What am I supposed to do about this? He goes on in verse 8. It says this. It says, But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. So here's... You know, here's big bad Naaman, you know, the, the military genius, you know. And he's got his horses, he's got his chariots, and he's got all of his money, and he's got his changes of clothes. I mean, this dude is ready. He's ready to barter. He's ready to buy this dude off. He's like, whatever it's going to take, I have come, and we're ready to go here. And in verse 10 it says, And Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha himself did not leave the house, okay? Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. This is an interesting piece. The prophet gives instruction now to Naaman but won't even do it in person, he finds out that Naaman's with the king and that the king is pitching a fit. And he's like, well, send that brother down here and I'm going to help him out. But when he gets there, he won't even leave the house. He's like, just go out there and tell him to go take a bath in a river. Right? To the guy who came with the money and the chariots and the changes of clothes, And in verse 11, we pick back up and it says, But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than... Than all the waters of Israel, could I not wash in them and be clean? This is like him basically saying, like, why do I have to go to the Cumberland? Couldn't I just take a bath in my own bathtub? You know, I mean, that's that's basically that's basically what he's saying there. It says so. He turned and went away in a rage. I don't know about you guys, but I'm just thinking, man, you traveled all this way. Like, come on, man. Like, just listen. Listen to this guy. You know, I know he didn't come out of the house for you. and I know you, you feel like you're a little too good to be just going down and taking a bath in the river. But, you know, and so then what, what happens? It says in verse 13, it says, But his servants came near him and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So, He went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of man of God. 
and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Why was this such a big deal for Naaman? This was a big deal for Naaman because Naaman thought he was a big deal. You know? I think there's something, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, there's definitely something that's happened generationally over the years and, uh, you know, with, you know, people having a hard time trusting people, you know, especially people that come off. I mean, and, and I find myself this way, you know, if I, if, if I'm with somebody and they kind of have a, an air about them of, you know, being cocky or, you know, whatever it is, you know, I, I'm kind of like, all right, all right, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm check you out I'll size you up you know and uh and and I think I think for Naaman he struggled here because he thought he was something special you know I mean he just thought he was the junk and he gets mad and I and I think a lot of this is because you know here's a guy who he didn't first of all he didn't really listen to what that little girl said, she just said there was somebody in Israel, and immediately his mind went to, well, i got to go to the king and get me a letter to go see the other king so that that king will tell this guy that can do this to do this for me. And I'm going to get my money together, and I'm going to get my clothes together, and we're going to have chariots and soldiers, and nobody's going to mess with us on the way, and we're going to roll up in there, and they're going to be like, oh, man, look at this guy. we got to do whatever he wants us to do. And we've called in our favors and we've phoned a friend and the whole nine yards. And at the end of the day, he gets to actually go to the prophet's house who doesn't come out and see him and sends a servant. And the servant says, go wash yourself seven times in the river. And it's a command that was so hard because it was so easy. Naaman, like so many of us in our lives and how we approach our relationship with the Lord, comes at this in a how can I earn this type of fashion. This is a lot of times how we approach our relationship with the Lord. You know, well, I, I mean, it can't be just as easy as believing, can it? I mean, you know, I mean, I've got to do something to earn it. I, you know, I work, I work hard and I do this and I've done all these great things and, you know, that's got to mean something and that's got to be a part of it. No. No, it doesn't. And sometimes that's the hardest part for people to overcome when it comes to understanding the gospel. Is that the gospel is so simple that it's admitting our weakness and to receive something that is literally a gift that's free for us. And all we can do is believe. All we can do is believe. We can't earn it. Can't go to church enough for it. Can't be good enough for it. Can't do some big thing, buy our way in, bring the army with us, trade our best gifts for it our salvation isn't based on what we can do or who we know it's based on the work of Jesus we come to God saying look at all that I've done or maybe look at all that I've suffered God however wants us to look to him and he says go and wash. I want to read this out of the book here. A little excerpt, two excerpts I'm going to read to you. It says, from the earliest parts of the Bible, it was understood that God could not forgive without sacrifice. No one who is seriously wronged can just forgive the perpetrator. If you have been robbed of money, opportunity, or happiness, you can either make the wrongdoer pay it back or you can forgive. But when you forgive, that means you absorb the loss and the debt 
you bear it yourself. All forgiveness then is costly. Forgiveness. You're like, what, what does forgiveness have to do with this story? That little girl, that little girl, little slave girl, how'd she get to be a slave girl? Let me just, you know, we, I know we read stuff like this, but I don't think a lot of times like we really take into effect like what's happened in that person's life. You know, she seems like a, she seems like a sideline player in the story, right? Is she though? Is she really a sideline player in the story? We get some information about her, and that's that she was taken during a raid. I don't know if you've got a little girl or not, or ever had a little girl, or even a little boy for that matter. If you've ever had a child, or maybe you have an affinity for a friend's child, and that's okay, we'll take that too. Just think about how much you care for them. You think about an army coming in, breaking up, possibly killing a family, and taking a little girl out of that situation to just take home with you like she's something you bought at Walmart. That's who this little girl is. Think of the trauma that she's been through. Think of what she's been through. And yet, despite what does she do, the second that she finds out that Naaman has leprosy, she's, she's the one throwing names around. She's the one like, oh, I know a guy. I know a guy that could fix that. If only you were with him, he would heal you. How in the world has she done that? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. You say, Chris, how do you know that she's forgiven this guy? Well, I mean, the opposite of that is, you know, that she would be bitter, want revenge, all of that. In that case, she'd be, you know, in a situation of something different. In fact, uh, uh, Keller talks about this, which we'll read a little bit to you. <coughs> it says, the slave girl <coughs> of Naaman's wife, who was captured by raiding bands of Syrians, at best, that meant that her family was taken captive and all sold off. At worst... It meant that they had been killed before her eyes. When we meet her in the story, she's at the bottom of the bottom of Syria, Syria's social structure. She's a racial outsider. She's a slave, a woman, and a young one, probably age 12 to 14. In short, her life has been ruined utterly. And who is responsible? Field Marshal Naaman, the supreme military commander, Yet how does, he, how does she respond when she learns that her nemesis has been struck down with leprosy? If we set our hearts on getting to the top, but instead find ourselves on the bottom rung of the ladder, it will usually lead to great cynicism and bitterness. We will desperately look around for people to blame for our failures. We might even indulge in our fantasies of revenge. Here's the interesting thing about this story. All throughout this story, we see God use a certain kind of person over and over again. You see it start with the slave girl. You see it start with this little girl who's been turned into a servant. Then you go to finally meet the prophet, right? And the prophet doesn't come out, who's he sent? Servant. He sends out a servant. Naaman, who's a guy who's used to, you know, rubbing shoulders with the big wigs, using his power and his money to get what he needs in life. And then after, after he gets to the prophet and the prophet tells him, go take a bath, right? Go wash. Who talks him into finally doing it after he's mad? His servants. His servants. Naaman needed to see that he was weak. 
Naaman needed to see that he was powerless over this. That this wasn't in his hands to fix. That he was going to have to trust the Lord to do this. And as usual, throughout the story, someone suffering is used by the Lord. And in this case, probably several someones who are suffering, but definitely this little girl. And that's something that we see over and over in Scripture until we see it in Christ Himself. And in Christ Himself, we read this in Philippians 2, verse 6. Though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Folks, idols must be replaced. We want to fight them, but the truth is, is that they need to be replaced. There may always be a tendency to a struggle in your life. May it be a sin or maybe, it may be, it's just this tendency to want to make a thing an idol. But I'm here to tell you, it's got to be replaced. And it can only be replaced by the Lord. We need to seek the Lord. When we grow in Him, that will change. We're not required to do something. Jesus already did. When we believe in what He's done, it begins to kill the addiction that we have to success. Let me read that again. When we believe in what He's done, it begins to kill the addiction we have to success. You say, oh, well, I do believe in Jesus, Chris, but I'm still struggling. No, no, no. No, you're not believing in Jesus to be enough. If you're still looking for something else to be your identity and to be your worth, through a servant, we are saved. His name is Jesus. Don't try harder. Trust God. You know that saying, winner, winner, chicken dinner. We love to win. Our saying should be this, winner, winner, sinner, sinner. Go and wash. Trust the Lord. Let Christ do the work in your life that only He can do to save you today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it helps us see through even the things that we don't want to see about ourselves. But God, I I just pray that you would help to continue to show us what it looks like, Lord, not just to follow you, but to trust in you, Lord, to grow in you, to be challenged by you. Lord, thank you for all these things. God, you are so good to us, so faithful to us. So amazing, so loving, so caring. Your grace is unparalleled by anything else in the entire world. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for sending Jesus to do what we couldn't do, to be enough. God, I pray, Lord, that we would take success off the altars of our lives, Lord, and that we would replace it with you. God, I pray that in our seeking of you and growing closer to you, that you would kill those urges, that you would slay those dragons in our lives. God, I pray for anyone, Lord, that has never trusted in you to be their Savior. God, I pray that today would be the day that you would do that work in their lives, Lord. May they trust in you. May they believe in the work in which you've done in sending your Son to die on the cross, to take our place, to take our death. God, thank you for the ultimate gift. God, in light of that today, we come and we worship you and we sing to you and we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be successful by any stretch of the imagination of something that has to do with this world, but Lord, that we have gotten exactly what we've needed. 
and it comes in you, and it comes in the form of your Son. God, we pray all this in His name today. Amen.